here. I was a lieutenant, first lieutenant. So you were trained in both uh, bombardier and navigation. Yeah. Oh, did you get two commission or two wings then? No, they they took my bomb sight out of the plane. Oh, okay. And I had to sit in the front and see everything in the dark. Mm. Yeah. Well, Larry, do you want to go first, or do you want me to do my? Um, let's see. I'll do a little introduction and then ask you some background questions, and then we'll get to your time in the infantry. Um, my name is Kevin Callahan. I'm here with Larry Sagstetter, and uh, we're here to do an oral history interview with Ed Erickson and his wife Betty. Um, Ed, what's your full name? My name is Edmund Malvin Erickson, E-D-M-U-N-D. -E and did you go by any nicknames or anything in the service? They call me Ed. Yeah. What's your... Uh, well, my poor co-pilot called me Shaq because I was so accurate with that bomb site. <laughs> <laughs> that's I shock Shaq every time. That's a good uh, good recommendation, I think, for Was the pilot that said that? The co-pilot. Co-pilot. What was your date of birth? 9-6-16 in Estland, South Dakota. And then uh, how old does that make you today? I'm 96. Three um, months. Three months. You just had your birthday three months ago. Well, yeah. Um, and then, um, what was your parents' names, and what was a little bit about their background? My dad's name was John Olaf Erickson. He came over here at the age of 19. Really? So he was the original immigrant yeah. to the United States? And my mother came over here when she was a baby, three years old. Oh, huh. That's a and, long... Uh, Eventually they met each other and got married and raised five boys and two girls. So you had a lot of uh, brothers and sisters growing up? Yeah. Um, where was it that you grew up then? Well, South Dakota. Well, I was born in South Dakota and when I was 10 years old. He moved, my dad moved the family to La Porte, Minnesota. Oh, okay. On yeah. a farm. And did you attend schools uh, growing up there in La Porte? Yes, we had a, a uh, consolidated school there. All the little, little schools had joined together and built a better school. Huh. It was a very good school. Yeah. Um, and then uh, could you tell me when your first experience with airplanes was? Was it as a kid or after you got into the Army Air Corps? When I was in uh, South Dakota, Uh, a airplane came over. The first one I saw, it was all red, and I remember I had to get a round tail like that, and we're heading for Huron, South Dakota, I guess. Wow. One of the World War, the first World War planes. Oh, a, like a biplane, one of the yeah, early. That's what it was. Like a Jenny or something. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Huh. How old do you think you were when you first saw that well, plane? I suppose I was. Uh, I suppose I was uh, eight years old. Was your uh, father in the First World War? No. No, he got out of that and uh, because he had a family and he was a farmer. Yeah. Actually, my grandfather had the same experience. They needed him more as the farmer to raise the food than they did as the soldier. That's right. So uh, they, he actually was in your farm and they sent him back to farm because they needed the food. Sure. So, um, did you have uh, jobs during the Great Depression then, or were you, did you have early jobs in your life? No. The Great Depression, that was a terrible thing. Yeah. Were you working on the farm growing up? I worked on the farm, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have, um, well, you graduated from high school then what year? 1934. Okay. That's the year our, our high school burned up. I actually gra graduated from the Baptist Church in town there, La Porte. <laughs> so they moved the schools, the, the students over to the church to finish? Right. Oh. Do they know why the fire happened? Well, I think the chimney 
started the chimney fire and burned the whole school down. Oh, how big a school was this? Oh, gosh. We had, uh, I suppose we had, a, it wasn't that big, I mean. I would say the most, uh, around a hundred total. Yeah. And then did you continue working on the farm after you graduated from high school, or what did you do after graduation? I uh, I got a job. Uh, one of the guys I graduated with, he he knew how to work in the timber business, so I hired out and worked for him mm -hmm. for a while. Were you um, in the military before Pearl Harbor, or our involvement in World War II, or was it afterward? that you started? Well, I got into the, uh, I'll tell you how I got into the infantry. Uh, when I was going to school, I heard the rumbling about this Adolf Hitler that everybody was, you know, noticed that, that he was pretty active. And anyway, one, uh, one fall, a neighbor boy and I went in September to pick potatoes in uh, North Dakota to work in the potato harvest. And we went there and on the 3rd of September, 1939, I was standing in front of Moore's Drug Store in Valhalla and I heard the news that he had invaded Poland huh. and I told the guy, hey, you know, our lives are going to be completely different now, pretty soon, I said. Mm -hmm. Because we're both going to be drafted. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. So did the, uh, uh, the draft start? I know there was a draft before we actually got started into the war on December 7th, 1941. Yeah, everybody, everybody yeah. had to register. Yeah. Yeah. And in 1942, I was called upon to go, and I went to, got on the bus, all the neighborhood kids that were going got on the bus, went to Fort Snelling, and uh, there a day or two, they didn't put us on a troop train, and headed for Camp Barkley, Texas, huh. and that's where I landed, Camp Barkley, Texas. Was that the, uh, for your basic training at yeah, Camp Barkley? that's right. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we had to stay there 90 days before I could go anywhere. We had to stay right on base 90 days. I'm so you didn't right. get any leave to get out and see the town or that sort of no, thing? No, not for 90 days. And then uh, there was no place to go anyway. <laughs> there was no beer in Texas. It seemed like most of the counties were dry. Huh. If you did drive a hundred or get a bus or be able to travel a hundred miles, you might be able to buy a beer, and their beer was no good anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you bought a hamburger, that's just like eating sawdust <laughs> because there was no meat in it. What is Camp Barkley uh, near? What town in Texas would that be by? Abilene. Oh, okay. Was Abilene. this a infantry primarily training? Uh, That's right. Learn how to salute and shoot a gun and yeah. that sort of thing? Yeah, all that stuff. And when... learned to salute the officers and they learned the 12 uh, rules of war and all that stuff. I don't remember any of that stuff anymore. But you learn to shoot. But I was a good shot before I ever got in the, the army. I was, always had that 22 with me wherever I went, and it was super accurate. Yeah, so you probably got a sharpshooter uh, badge or whatever. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah, I got that. Well, when you finished your basic training, were you, uh, you were an infantry private? Yeah. And um, what did you do from that point? Well, we went uh, on bivouac, you know, go out in the brush and stay overnight and practice different things. 
and the uh, officer tried to pick out who, whoever would be a good leader, a squad leader and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Did you end up as a squad leader? Well, they tried to make me that Lieutenant Wonky. What a heck of a signal you gave, he said. What a lousy signal arm I gave him. <laughs> what a lousy signal, he said. <laughs> Okay, so he didn't like that. <laughs> well, I didn't care to be a leader anyway, because usually the leader is the first one to get to be shot. Yeah, right. Um, so, do you recall what you're paid as a private in the U.S. Army way back then? Yeah, it was. Uh, at first, I think it was eleven dollars a month. Then they raised it to twenty-one dollars a month. Oh, that was that, a that big raise. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have to send stuff home or buy bonds or anything with that? Or That's not a no, lot of money. No, I didn't, no. Yeah. Um, so after you became an infantry private, uh, what was the, did you eventually go into the Army Air Forces or was that later? Well, you see, I was in the infantry two years. Mm -hmm. I trained with the infantry at 90th Division. And uh, what happened, I had a chance to go to radio school to learn uh, Morse code yeah. at Camp Barclay. So I went for that. I thought that would be nice. So I learned that. And uh, me and another guy, we got, we were pretty good competitors. One day the, my platoon lieutenant came and he said, one of you guys is going to go to Camp Barkley for more training in uh, Morse code and more uh, radio school. And he said, uh, I'll flip a coin. He flipped the coin and I won. I was sent to Fort Benning and stayed there three months. And I got to, so I could uh, receive and send 26 words a minute by code. And, uh, I helped a lot of other guys pass too. You know, I just scribble a piece of paper and pass it back to some guy that had a heck of a time making it. <laughs> I passed maybe five or six guys like that. Well, uh, so you had a lot of a lot of different training. You not only we had radio training, but later you became a navigator and a bombardier. Like so you should have seen the stuff we had to train with. We go out in the woods and I'd have a hand generator like that, uh -huh. and the guys supposed to use that using another radio, using the juice coming from the generator to communicate with other people. The worst thing you ever saw in your <laughs> life. Well, did you uh, learn the Morse code so you can still remember any of it 70 years later? Or do you think oh, yeah. Oh, you still recall some of that? Yeah. 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 A is da-da, B is da-da-da-da, C is da 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 It's hard to... <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> it's hard to forget. Yeah, well, you must have overlearned that. That was pretty right. good after all this time. Um, so two years you were in the infantry then. Yeah. And were you stationed uh, in Texas the whole time, or did they well, move you around? Well, you know what happened then when I came back from Fort Benning? My outfit was on maneuver in Louisiana. Oh. So I was able to get a pass from the officer of the day to go to Abilene if I want to. Sure, he said, you get on the bus, go to Abilene, you have nothing else to do, he said. So I went to Abilene, uh, you know, one, two, three days. And one day I was in Abilene and I, I looked up and I saw a sign, join the Air Force. Hey, how can that be? I said. I went up the steps and asked the guy about it. Can, it. can I join the Air Force if I want to? Sure, he said. You're a soldier here at infantry. Here. All these infantry guys are in good health. You don't need a test for anything. Just sign your name in here. Huh. Anyway, the outfit was on maneuver, so I, they sent me. I took, uh, by bus to where they were on maneuvers. And I was on maneuvers 
using my, that heavy radio that weighed about 50 pounds, carrying that on my back huh. and across the Sabin River between Texas and Louisiana, and I almost fell in there with that heavy radio on my back. A couple of guys gave me a hand so I didn't fall in and drown. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, one day, on the maneuver, here comes a guy with a clipboard in his hand, he said. Are you Edmund Erickson? Yes, I am, he said. I said, well, get on that bus. You're going to San Antonio. Huh. That's how I got in the Air Force. Wow. Huh. So they must have really needed people then oh, yeah, uh, think, at the time. I think they decided in this country that they wouldn't win the war unless they got a great big Air Force. Yeah separate by itself, not connected to the Army or the Navy or stuff like that. Yeah. Do you recall the unit uh, you were in in the infantry? What the the name of the whatever division or? I was in 358th Infantry, mm -hmm. <coughs> 2nd Battalion, F Company. Oh, okay. And then uh, suddenly you're on your way to San Antonio Aviation Cadet yep. uh, Center for... Uh, yep. What was the first thing they did uh, there? Were you in classification or? You know what happened there, the first thing? Hmm. They had this class, class uh, hazing thing going. Huh. They put me up there on the balcony. I put the watch for submarines <laughs> and holler. I can't see any submarines. <laughs> there are no submarines around. <laughs> uh, yeah, were, that lasted for two days, I would say. And the government decided to put an end to all that stuff, foolishness like that. There was no more hazing. No more hazing. You had to get down to business. You had then. to get down to business. Yeah. So what was the first thing the, the Army Air Forces did? Did they, uh, did they classify you or did they uh, give you some kind of schooling or, or what was the, the first well, thing? Well, yes, they did. Uh, they gave you training. Uh, and different things. I wanted to be a pilot, so eventually, eventually, I was sent to uh, Brider Field, Arkansas. How, how do you spell that one? Brider, G R I D E R, Brider Field, mm -hmm. and that was in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Okay. And the first thing that happened to me, uh, learning to fly, uh, he took me up about 3,000 feet and put me in a spin. And at 1,500 feet, you know, you kick opposite rudder and point down and you pull up. And he said, uh, my instructor back of me, he was sitting back of me, he noticed that my sh shoulders shrugged a little bit like that when he put me in the spring. And he said, well, I, you're a little bit, uh, you're not like these younger guys, he said, that just love to be in a spin. You're, you're a little bit older and probably got more common sense <laughs> than old young kids. I could probably make you the best pilot in the world, he said, but we don't have time to spend so much time with so he washed out of the five people that he had, washed out two of them, me and another fellow. Huh. They usually wash out two and they keep three. Yeah. And uh, that's the way that, anyway, I, I told my instructor, I'll go to something different and I'll go for, uh, to be a bombardier, learn to be a bombardier. Mm -hmm. So then I was sent to Midland, Texas, to learn how to run the the bomb site, the Norton bomb site, yeah. mm -hmm. which was a wonderful instrument, really. It was a mechanical instrument, but it was really accurate. If you put the crosshair on the target and you keep the target on there, you look away for a while and you look back, yeah, the crosshair is still on the target. Well, then you you're free to lift the lever, which will drop the bombs when the right 
second comes along. So you just had to line it up and flip the switch and then it would drop the bomb for you. Yep. Yeah. As long as you had the crosshair on, that bomb would hit the, that shack. Huh. Yeah. Shack on the ground, yeah. Were they training you in, uh, what, B-24s for this? Uh, for the bombardier training? Uh, we had, uh, we had different planes, but we ended up using the B-24 for that. Yeah. <coughs> so did you then get uh, commissioned as a officer, as a bombardier? Yes. In Midland? Yes. I got to be a, a second lieutenant, and after he flew a few missions over France uh, doing this stuff to help the French underground, then uh, I was promoted to first lieutenant. Oh, okay. And then... Um, so you actually flew f missions as a bombardier in France? Yep. And then... Um, Without the bomb sight. Huh. Oh. They, they took, took that out. Why? Well, I just sat in the nose. Yeah. I had to see in the dark. And my uh -huh. navigator was behind lights, a blanket. He was in lights. I was in the dark. But the way I could see in the dark, I put seven layers of uh, brown paper over the bulb of the two south flashlight, and then I could see, look at the map, and look at the ground. My eyes didn't have to undergo any change. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. And uh, there was enough light on the ground that you could make out where to drop the. Yeah, well, there were no lights on the ground. What light you had came from star shine or whatever you had. Yeah. You couldn't see a light on the ground during the war, unless once in a while I would see a, a line on the ground, red, extending miles from this way all the way that way. I don't know what it was. must have been a, some kind of fire on the ground, a mm -hmm. line of fire. Huh. Like a brush fire or something yeah, like something that. Like that. Yeah. Did you get your navigation training uh, in the States after the bombardier training, or was that later? I just learned that by myself. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so, did you get assigned to a uh, crew then after you received your wings and, and became a bombardier? We, we went to uh, Salt Lake City. That's where our crew was formed. formed. Mm -hmm. That's where I learned, met Fox, Sanderson, and Haldeman the other three officers, and the rest of the crew. Yeah. That's where we formed our crew. Fox was the pilot? Yeah. And uh, what were the other ones? What was their jobs? Uh, William Sanderson was the navigator. Okay. And uh, my co-pilot was Ed Hallman. Hallman. And uh, did the... Did the plane that you were using during the crew assignment where you were kind of learning how to work as a crew, was that the same plane that you, you took over to Europe or was no, it? No. That did was you get assigned a, a, a plane later? Yeah. We, uh, we went to, uh, this is how we got our plane. We went to, we were sent to Lincoln, Nebraska. There we picked up a brand new B-24 and flew that Syracuse, New York, we stayed there overnight, I believe, then from there we went up to Goose Bay, Labrador. Wow. And uh, that's where we took off with the brand new B-24, and we're not supposed to look at anything until you got into the air. Then the navigator looked up to see where we were going. We both to go to Reykjavik, Iceland. And we landed there. We took off about took off about 10:30 at night from Goose Bay, and it was so soupy up there at that time. You couldn't see the outboard propellers turning. But we took off, and the next morning we we landed in Reykjavik, huh. Iceland, and we had something to eat there. We took off again and flew to Crest, 
Prestwick, Scotland, I believe. Mm -hmm. Was that the name of that? Yeah, I think. Yeah, there is a Prestwick. I know. Yeah, and we left the the new bomber there. Oh. So we were put on a train, and we ended up at station station one seventy nine Harrington Field. Oh. That's where we flew from to do this underground work to help the French underground. Were you uh, assigned a unit with the 8th Air Force, particular bomb group or anything? Oh, it was with the 801st when we got through 279, Station 279. And then uh, this uh, uh, 801st uh, 492nd. The 492nd had been flying high altitude bombardment, but they were flying tail and low. They were in a bad position and they were getting their rear end shot off. That was the most dangerous position. Yeah, so they, the General did a Doolittle, he took them off of that and put them, some of them, with uh, doing the same kind of work that we're going to do helping the French, uh, French underground. Oh. So we'll split up that way. So yeah. you started off doing night night missions. That's that's interesting. And yeah. uh, um, you had to be able to pick out the, the landing spot. Was it supplies and we, that sort of thing? The French underground would have a target set up of lights, like two lights and I had two more lights and uh, two more lights and that showed you a light at the end showed you which direction to come in against the wind. Oh. So you could come in slow and low altitude. We dropped at four hundred feet. Wow, that is which slow. was pretty dangerous. Yeah. If your wingtip would happen to hit a a high piece of high ground or something, yeah. you spin out and crash and burn. You know, that happened to a lot of them. Uh, we were pretty lucky, but we were very careful, too. Did you fly as an individual plane then on these missions? Or did you go in a group of uh, other B-24s? They went one at a time. Yeah, so it was just your plane, you dropped the thing and then you came back. It wasn't a large squadron. Just one, one at yeah. a time. Huh. It so happened also, one night we were over the target and here comes another B-24. Right over us, and our engineer thought it was an enemy fighter, and he shot at it. <laughs> wow! Put a couple of bullets through the wing, and next morning, uh, heard somebody say, "Hey, we picked up a couple of bullet holes last night." Oh, boy. We didn't say anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> so Harrington Field, what was that? Uh, what was that like? What did that uh, base? Was that a regular Army Air Forces base, or well, was it uh, special? It was special. Yeah. Thing, yeah. It was, it was for these kind of missions. That, that's right. Yeah. It was very secret. We were not even allowed to talk with our crew members about anything. You keep uh, you know, keep your mouth shut. Huh. Don't say anything. That's, you know. They didn't want to jeopardize the French underground by no. somebody talking. Well, the one funny thing that happened. Somebody in 1945 put something about what we were doing to help the underground, French underground, in the Reader's Digest. Oh. Oh. I wonder if a guy could look that up somehow now. Yeah, that sure. Long ago. Yeah, but you never heard any more about that. Evidently, they were told to shut up and quit doing that stuff. Otherwise, you know, they give away the whole secret. Now we were talking a little bit before we got started, and you have had a lot of missions. How many total missions did you figure? Fifty-six. Oh, okay. And then how many of the missions uh, were involved with uh, the 801st, 492nd Bomb Squadron? Was that all of the missions, or, yeah, or some of them? Yeah. The uh, 492nd came in uh, shortly after uh, I landed at the... Uh, at Harrington. Oh, they well, created yeah, they, that. Yeah, they came in pretty quick. Yeah. Um, 
Were all 56 of your missions at night uh, supporting the French underground, or were there other uh, types of missions? At night, well, when we got to, you had to have, what happened, uh, eventually, my squadron was sent to Brindisi, Italy, oh. and some of those missions were short missions and daylight, but not too many. But most of my missions were night missions. Were you still with the 8th Air Force when you went to Italy, or did they switch you to a different... Yeah, uh, still with the... Uh, same group. Although we were attached to a different unit. Yeah. I, uh, we have a name of that, Betty has something to read, and the name of that other outfit we were attached to. Well, we had a lot of uh, people in our 8th Air Force group that were with the 15th Air Force uh, that were flying uh, out of uh, Foggia. Where was Brindisi? Right Italy? on the heel of the boot. Oh, okay. Well, what kind of uh, base was that? Was that uh, Quonset Huts or Nissen Huts or was it Tents? Well, or? something like that, yeah. 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 I'd like to have Betty read this. Or you want to read it? No, go ahead. If you've got uh, something there, is it, is it, well, we could read it later too, whatever's. Yeah, why don't you finish with that and then we'll get to that. Okay, come uh, back to the. Yeah, the, come back to that. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so you're in Brindisi and um, you're with the same. Uh, well, see, group. part of this that she's going to read comes before Brandeisi. She'll get to that eventually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'd like to have her read it because okay. yeah. she can read better than I. I'm. I only have one eye, and I can't see too much with that. Yeah. You have uh, you one. You've got lost the sight in one eye. Is is what you're saying. Yeah, I lost an eye here from uh, infection. Uh, can you can you read this for us? Then? I can't. I can't can read, read this. this. I want Betty to read that. Yeah. You want to yeah. Read it go ahead. Can you sit down? Yeah. Can you see? Start from the beginning. I read the whole thing. You need a light or? Yeah, I can get a phone. I got paste right there, so. There you go. You had enough light or four. Better turn them all on. They're not all on, are they? Turn all the lights on. I get them. I get them. Three of them. There you go. There. Okay. What should I say? <laughs> read it like you did. Okay. You read it before. Okay. I'm Betty and Erickson's wife. I'd like to read this that Ed wrote. Our crew, after picking up a new Liberator B-24 in Lincoln, Nebraska, came over the northern road to Goose Bay, Labrador, and Reykjavik, Iceland, then on to a modification center in Scotland. There we boarded a train which eventually delivered us to a place where waiting trucks transport us to Harrington Field, station number 179. The 801st Bomb Group was stationed here as a carpetbagger operation to be joined later by the 492nd Bomb Group. Here we learned that we were to fly at night helping the French underground, the Mar Marquet. The planes had only four guns, top and tail gut turrets. The belly turret was removed to make a large opening for dropping supplies and personnel. This opening was called the Joe Hole. After secret agents we only knew as Joes. Along with the reduction in armament, crews were reduced from ten to eight men. After a short training period in England, we were flying successful night missions, dropping equipment and operatives to French resistance fighters. The secret of succession of success was pinpoint charting of the course after briefing by the intelligence section. Lieutenant Sanderson, the navigator, and I, Lieutenant Erickson, the bomb bombardier, worked closely together to plan the safest route to be taken while staying away from known enemy gun emplacements. Lieutenant Sanderson, during the mission, worked in a lighted compartment. I on the other hand, had to be able to see in the dark 
locating verifying checkpoints along the way. I found that by placing seven layers of wax paper from K rations packages over the lens of a two cell flashlight, I could see the checkpoints on the map and on the ground without my eyes undergoing any change from one to the other. The maps we were provided with were excellent. At this time, a tour consisted of 25 missions. We had almost that many when the tour length was changed to 30. When we were close to 30 missions, it was changed to 35. <laughs> and then it went up from there. <coughs> General Patton's tank corps was now developing a fuel shortage. The copper beggars were called upon to help deliver gas to keep his campaign going. Bombay tanks were used along with the wingtip tanks, which were dis disconnected from the main tanks to facilitate unloading up on landing in Belgium. Oh. Bombardiers were not utilized during this operation, probably because pinpoint navigation was not required in this situation. My crew flew, flew four gas missions, and by that time the crisis was over. Oh. Next, the 8th 59th Squadron received a new assignment to continue the carpetbagger operation from a base in Brindisi, Italy. This move came in the last week of December, 1944. There we became part of the 2641st Provisional Group, commanded by Colonel Monroe McCloskey. His squadron, the, 85th, the 885th, had been involved in carpetbagger missions for some time before we arrived in Brindisi. We flew night missions across the Adriatic Sea to various parts of Yugoslavia, dropping supplies and operatives to the partisans and having good success. None of these missions were exceptionally long. Our next mission was to be long. From Brindisi, from Brindisi on the heel of the Italian boot to the northern border of Italy over high rugged mountains, it was also be one of our most dangerous and exciting. The date was February 25th, 1945. We proceeded uneventfully to the target area. Everything was in readiness as we approached, but the target was not there this night. The navigator and I verified that we decided the target had been scrubbed for the night. Lieutenant Anderson, checking drift, ground speed, etc., was aware that there had been a big change of wind direction, now coming from the west at gale speed. Before we could arrive at the heading, we were far out over the Adriatic Ocean. Sea. Sea. Adriatic <laughs> Sea. Now came the discovery by the engineer, Sergeant Popcox, that he was unable to transfer gas from the wingtip tanks to the main tanks. We were stunned when the sudden realization came that we were in a deadly crisis. Sergeant Cox knew immediately what must have happened. The engineering staff back in England had neglected or forgotten to reconnect the tanks. We were going to run out of gas oh. in a very short time. Co-pilot Lieutenant Holloman began calling the emergency call Mayday over and over, hoping to make contact with someone who could help us. I myself was more than a little skeptical about any results from a distress call in the middle of the night from a lone airplane out there in the blackness. <laughs> Knowing the seriousness of the situation, the pilot, Captain John Fox, started medical action immediately. He ordered everything that was loose to be dropped in order to alight the plane. Oh. I ordered Sergeant Nick McComb, the dispatcher, to throw everything in the waste out through the jaw hole but to keep our Joe from jumping out. I tripped the salvo lever and everything dropped into the depths of the Adriatic Sea. Huh. After what seemed to be a long period of time, there came a definite response to our distress call. To me, this was no less than a miracle. Eventually, we were given a heading to the nearest airfield where we could land. This was Foggia about halfway up the east coast of Italy. On this new heading, our ground speed was further reduced because now we were flying directly into the wind. It seemed to me that we were moving only inch by inch 
a portion of the Italian coastline. Captain Fox proceeded to gradually gain altitude for a little extra insurance. I looked in on Sanderson. He was busy with his navigation. I told him to get shoot, to get his chute and life raft strapped on. He just kept on with his calculations. The waves must have been 20 feet high that night, so he could, would not have lasted long in the drink anyway. Luck was with us. We made it to Fulger Airfield, and here Captain Fox made one of the smoothest landings ever. He had learned his trade well. Sergeant Cox checked the remaining gas supply and determined that we had, at the most, ten minutes left. Oh, boy. <coughs> when we got out of the plane over, our Joe calmly filled his pipe and had a smoke. After refueling, we returned to Brindisi. We had been a very successful crew. However, after that happened, I did not consider it unusual to be called upon for an explanation of the events that had taken place. Captain Fox, Lieutenant Holman, and Lieutenant Sanderson were called in by Colonel McManus, the commanding officer. They learned that it had been especially important to complete this mission, or at the least, to return with the cargo which had been entrusted to us. We had done what had to be done, and this was understood by command. But the cargo I had salvoed into aviator was several million dollars in gold bullion. Oh, boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Colonel McCoskey, one of the 85th Squadron, in his book, The Secret War, made reference to another mission in which the cargo was gold. This was delivered to the target, but the person expecting it never received it. It was spirited away mysteriously, and where it went, nobody knows. We finished our tour at Brandeisi, accumulating 56 missions total. This was told by First Lieutenant Edmund and M. Erickson, Bombardier, 859th Squadron, 801st, 492nd Bomb Group. Well, can I get a copy of that? Or you can have copy? that. Do you have extras? Pardon? Do you have extras to, for yourself? Do you, you have the original? or? Yeah. Okay. So I can keep this then? Yeah. Great. And then also this here, if you want it. Wow, that's quite a story. This is, this is Ed's group here. Oh, wow, great. That's Ed and Sanderson, Cox, and this is the pilot. And these are the enlisted men. Great, I'll put this in the newsletter. Could you kind of just put, show that up on front of the camera? Yeah, that's Ed's crew right Yeah, there. no, bring it close and uh, just so people can see it that are watching the video. Yeah, and then maybe in front of this one. Here, let me... Have it for just a minute. Yeah. Now let's see. You're which which one? He's you're... on the top right left. Oh, okay. The far left. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's very well written. Yeah, what you did. That's really good. You're lucky yeah. to be here, hearing that story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they, they didn't they didn't give you a lot of grief about losing that gold because you're I mean it was either that or trash the plane. <laughs> Or go down in the Adriatic, I guess, huh? Our son always wanted to go down there. Our scuba diver, he wanted to see if he could find it. Yeah, do you know the exact location of the millions of dollars of gold that uh, you salvoed? Well, I imagine the navigator <laughs> made a recording of where it would drop, but where is that now? Yeah. yeah. It cost money to go down there to get it, too, you know. <coughs> yeah, but what a story. At one time, uh, my uh, squadron... Uh, uh, Colonel McManus, I asked him how many million did, were dropped. He said $16 million worth of bullion. Wow. Wow. That's probably like a couple hundred million today. Yeah. Well, there were, in the war like that, there are some uh, deals like that made, I suppose, yeah. for some reason. What for? Uh, that must have been quite heavy to have that much gold. I mean, gold's a, one of the heaviest uh, metals. Were you, you weren't aware of any of this until after no. the mission? We never knew what we had in the plane. It was secret. Did wow. they they have it in boxes or some kind of a bomb? A round, round cylinder like that, about five, six feet long, you know, several of them. Huh. 
Was this how they paid troops that were in the partisans in Yugoslavia, or do you know, know what they did with the? I don't. I don't know. I, I think it's just a financial deal be between some big shots, you know, during the war. Yeah. What a story. That's incredible. That a great story. <laughs> well, so you made it back okay. It sounded like you barely made it back, though, with... Uh, ten minutes worth of gas left. Yeah, yeah. Jeez. Those engines burned uh, 250 gallons of gas an hour, those four engines. And you had 5,000 horsepower there. Yeah. Oh. That was quite an airplane. Um, High octane gas, 200 octane. Compared to what you drive now, you drive 87 octane in your in your car. Did you um, take any pictures or anything when you were in the service, or did you have access to that sort of no, thing? No, I never had anything to take pictures with. Yeah. But really. Uh, You're probably on a secret, more more secret. I think missions. we were we're not supposed to do anything of that, you know. Yeah. Um, did you have letters or anything that you kept from writing home, or did your family keep any of that, that kind of documents? No, no. And um, I wrote letters home, but they uh, they didn't keep. Them, uh, I didn't see any of them when I came back. They just read them and put them with the rest of the mail. So besides the uh, the fact that they didn't connect the the gasoline tanks correctly, where and it sounded like it was dangerous going over the Alps because um, of the height of the mountains, was that oh, yeah. part of the danger of it? Well, <clears throat> the B twenty four didn't have any problem with the height, but uh, why didn't those people that disconnected the tank? Why wasn't it their job when this was all done to reconnect them? Yeah. If you disconnect it, you would think they would reconnect it before they yeah. they let the plane go. Um, so, did you make it all the way back to Brindisi, or did you hit the first base that was available? We hit uh, Foggia Field, that was halfway on the east coast of Italy, halfway up. Oh, okay. Yeah, Foggia. Yeah. Finally got a, a signal back from them and a and a heading. It was a heading to reach that. And he made a real smooth landing, and we had probably 10 minutes worth of gas left in the tank, going to the engineer. So we were pretty lucky. Yeah, you were very lucky. Did did you, um, uh, were you at Brindisi then when the war ended? Or yeah. did you finish your missions before the, the VE? We, uh, well, we finished, uh, we, we the, the war was over, and then we waited to get some ride back home to our home, back to the United States. I finally got a ride on a, a ship. I, it was either called uh, America or West Point. I forget. Anyway, I rode uh, that ship home. And landed at Newport News. It took nine days. Oh, huh. Yeah. Did you have any problems with getting seasick on a voyage no. that long? No. And Red Skelton, was the Red Skelton was on your oh, on yeah? ship? Oh yeah. Yeah, Red Skelton was aboard our ship on oh. the way back. Home. Really? Was he, he? He was going around telling jokes, uh -huh. you know, to different people. And yeah. So he was part of the, what the USO shows or? What? Yeah, I suppose he was. A, he was an entertainer, you know. And was this uh, like a large number of people, I assume, on this ship? Oh, there must have been 10,000. Wow. They were stacked like sardines in the can. Did they, uh, did they keep uh, doing the zigzagging and all that, or was that over no. once the war finished? That was all done. There were no more submarines yeah. to look out for. What, uh, Germany surrendered, and uh, there, there was no more any submarine warfare like that. Did people celebrate in Brindisi at the base then when they heard the news that the war ended? 
Did they well, do anything particular? See, when the war ended, I was in uh, Naples. Mm -hmm. Naples, waiting for a, a ship to go home. So I don't know what they did in Brindisi then. When the, but the war ended. The president died while I was in, uh, in that place waiting for a ride home. Oh, okay. He was. I think he passed away in like April twelfth or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then the 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 surrender, I think, was May eighth. So it was not that long after that VE yeah. uh, day happened. Um, do you have memories of VE day, or was it just another day? As far as I'm concerned, it was a VE day. Uh, because, but uh, some places like in this country, they really had celebrated and the France. England and France, you know, because the war was over, they really got riled up, you know. Well, I was told by some of the people on the 8th Air Force bases in England that they went out with the flare guns and fired yeah. into the the haystacks and, and caught them all on fire, oh. so they went a little crazy. <laughs> they had to pay for that later. Burned up the haystacks. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you, you arrived at, was it Newport News? Is it yeah, in Virginia? News, Virginia. Yeah. And then uh, were you discharged right away or did they keep you for Japan? No, they, or? Me, uh, they uh, sent me to California, which was surprising, for a few days, a couple of weeks, I guess. And uh, they had, uh, they really took care of the veterans coming back there, all kinds of food. And, uh, you know, tried to fatten you up after the war. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they sent me back to Fort Snelling, and they discharged me from there. I could have stayed in the Air Force, but I thought, well, I don't know, I think I just, I could have become a squadron bomb or bombardier in Italy if I'd have stayed there. I thought, well, I think I've had enough. Why take any more chances? <laughs> Were you married to Betty at the time, or no? no. Is it after the war? I after the war. I see. When were you uh, finally discharged then at Fort Snelling? Was that in '45 or '46? It was '45. Uh, yeah, I think uh, August '45. Well, you had a lot of points built up from all the missions. Well, you know. You only needed 85 points to be discharged, and I had 115. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with all the missions you were on. Yeah. What did you do then after you were discharged? Did you go home or take some time off? Or I took some time off. Yeah, I helped my brother, older brother. He was the only guy left to keep the farm going, you know. And I helped him a little bit. Uh, Quite a bit, really. And then I decided I'd go to, go to St. Paul to find a job, which I did. I, I did a different job, but I always came home when deer hunting was here, you know, because mm -hmm. I was a deer hunter. And then finally I got looking for a job, and I ended up at Paper Cattlemen's and Steel. And they hired me as a punch press operator, 90, 94 cents an hour. Huh. Before the war, I was earning 40 cents an hour. That's what you were earning too, wasn't it, Betty? Yeah. 40 cents an hour. Can you imagine? I can't imagine. <laughs> well, I packed the, the uh, um, what do you call it? Incendiary, incendiary bomb, bombs, yeah. She could bombs. pack those incendiary bombs when they fit. Know. And then I don't know I was packing the bombs that he dropped. Oh. Really? Huh. Uh. Well, um, so how did you meet? Or uh, you met after the war uh, at the the paper Calmanson? Well, really, uh, one time Joel Larkin, my buddy, we had been in the Pacific War. We we're standing at. Coronado on University <coughs> and Snelling and having a beer and here comes this pretty girl walking by 
Come on, her. <laughs> so you, uh... The old sand, there's a girl, you better marry her. And we did, and, uh, you did me. We met on the prom ballroom. Oh, yeah? Really? Huh. Prom ballroom we met, yeah. So he gave you some good advice then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were bowling too at the... Uh, Midway Gardens. Midway Gardens, yeah. Where was uh, the steel portion of Paper Kalmuth's and was that uh, St. Paul or...? That was, uh, you go west on County Road B to... To where 280 is now? Yes. That's it right there. There was a sign there that says, Dead End. <laughs> That's where I ended up working. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you... I, I worked there 35 years. Wow. Uh, it took me nine years to get control of the industrial department. And I, I was the big boss of the industrial department. We would make anything that a customer would want. Huh. That was a very interesting job. Always something new. And it was steel products, yep. basically. Make everything yeah. out of steel. You punch the steel, you roll the steel, you <coughs> you bent it and welded it. Yeah. Now, uh, that's an enormous building, isn't it? If I'm thinking of oh, the right it one. Is. It's just, a, and it's a it's been there a long time, that industrial park uh, area there. Yeah. And so on the inside, it was, I've never been inside that building. I've driven past it for many decades. Well, but they it, had cranes running overhead <laughs> to lift the steel with mm -hmm. cranes, you know, 10 ton cranes. And uh, as another bay they built later, N Bay, <coughs> where they built bridges for state of Minnesota. They had a 50-ton crane there. Now it was all sold to an Alaskan outfit. And they sell it, they're selling steel by hundreds of tons every day. Yeah. So this wasn't where, like, they would fire and make steel. This was where well, you would manufacture products they from steel. They made steel objects <laughs> out of steel. Our steel came from U.S. Steel out east. Mm -hmm. And it was in the form of coils, a five-eighths thick steel, eight foot wide. It wrapped up like toilet paper. Yeah. You know, coils like that. Did you uh, retire then? What, what what year would that have been? Eighty-two, nineteen eighty-two. Uh, none of our crew decided to get the whole crew together like that, but we've been to a, a lot of reunions. Yeah. A lot of reunions. Was that with the 801st, uh, the reunions, or was it 8th uh, Eighth Eighth, Air Force? 8th Air Force. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes the uh, 2nd uh, Division and uh, our own uh, underground, we, uh, we met with that reunion, and we met with the main 8th Air Force. Many times. We've been, we've been with many reunions, haven't we, Betty? Yeah, and we're also, that we're invited to all your officers' uh, houses and stayed there for a week at a time. Oh, so, where was that at? Well, one of them, the, the uh, co pilot, lives in uh, Legionnaire, we live in Pennsylvania. Legionnaire, Leg Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, the co pilot. Yeah. He's got a big uh, little land there with uh, was, uh, all. Uh, Gas on the underground. Yeah. Oh, natural oh, gas. Oh, that land was worth millions. Oh. And other, and your um, navigator lives in Utah, so they took us all around Utah, so we saw, oh. you know, while they stayed there for a week. Yeah. A couple times. Then the fox, he has a farm in Wisconsin. Uh, he, we were invited to his anniversary. Fiftieth oh. anniversary. And he'd come call me on the phone and say. Going to be home today? And I said, Well, yeah, we're going to church, but otherwise we'll be home. Well, we're going to, is it okay if we stop over? Well, then I, I said, Sure. And then I fixed a big dinner for him a couple of times, uh -huh. and about three, four times I came over. Yeah. And I had some potatoes I made in the oven 
Potato. Baked potato. Oh. I don't know. I, I, what I put in the onion. Sue Fox really it. loved those baked potatoes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then she wants me to raise her letter and says, she doesn't say anything about the ham or that, you know. But she says, those potatoes, how did you make those baked potatoes? <laughs> So you got together individually once in a while with the different oh, yeah. crew members. Well, I'm intrigued by the, you worked in the uh, the arms manufacturing of the incendiary devices? Is that what you said? Most, most of them I worked, yeah. She packed them. Then I packed those incendiary bombs. Then I also helped um, um, assemble those little flares. Yeah, they must have been uh, hand grenades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I assembled those. And this was where? At Lewis F. Dow Company. Where's that located? That's on Hamden and uh, oh, it's not no, anymore. Hamden and University. Hamden University. University, yeah. Oh. Was it um, uh, dangerous work with uh, packing incendiary devices? No, not really. Yeah, they were pretty careful with how they did it. But you didn't know what it was that was going into the, into well, the package? What we call uh, hand grenades. They were not loaded yet. No. Oh, okay, so the explosive part wasn't yeah. in there yet, yeah. And what did it look like when it was done, when you were done with, what What did what did the, the appearance the, the look like? Grenade, those hand things, you mean? Yeah. Oh, well, they were just, uh, well, they were hard to pack. They were, uh, you know, had the kind of hexagon, is that what you call it? Yeah. Yeah, you had to pull them this way. And I could pack those things so fast that they came off there. And most everybody working there was union, and I wasn't union. And the boss liked me because I could pack them so fast and accurate. Uh -huh. Otherwise, the box would crumble up, you know. Mm -hmm. And so then one of the union guys came in there and saw me, and he said, "What's she working in here for? We're all laid off, uh, you know. And she's not even in the union, and here she's working." Then the boss said, "Oh, don't worry. You'll be back in a couple of days, you know." Were they, were they on strike or something? Yeah, the unit was on strike. Really? They sh had yeah, strikes during the Second World War yeah. on arms. That's interesting. I didn't know that, huh? And how long did you uh, work there? Was this throughout the war? Or? Oh, well, then they changed. To, then I worked for the superintendent afterwards. Then they were in a, in a calendar of business, but I sort of worked there about... Uh, what, uh, I suppose 17 years, mm -hmm. and then I, then I was laid off for a little while. But the, the, uh, the guy, whatever by his name was uh, the guy who hired people, and he always tell the unemployment <coughs> business that I'd be back in a few weeks, a day or so, so you know I could keep collecting employment, unemployment, well. and uh, but then afterwards, I decided I wasn't going to collect unemployment anymore. I just got I better look for a different job, you know. So I went to Johnson Brothers in Rosedale, and he said, yeah, you can start working here you know, anytime right now, you know. And but he said, you have to work Saturdays and Sundays. Oh, there I was laid off to be free, more or less, and we were going on a cruise. And I said, no, I can't work Saturdays or Sundays. Well, then I can't hire you, he said. Hmm. So then I, then I got pregnant, and I thought, well, I was still collecting unemployment, and I thought, well, that's not fair, you know, because I really don't want to real work now, you know. So then I just told him that I don't want any more employment, that I was going to, you know, stay home. How many... Stayed, mm -hmm, go ahead. Well, then I stayed home for, until the kids were, well, old enough to go to kindergarten or school. And then I went into Rose, Roseville. I um, mean, uh, what, Harmar. And I walked in there one day and I says, I'd like to, uh, you know, look for, I'm looking for a job. I walked into this clothing uh, factory and I said, uh, you know, I'd like to get a job. She says, sure, you can start tomorrow. And, uh, and then the phone rang after I got home and says, can you come in tomorrow? Then I got to be the boss afterwards. Oh. And uh, then they, they sent me to Rosedale. <coughs> to take care of that. And finally, he transferred me to Rosedale. That was his real, the girl he liked, and she was pretty good. I said, don't tell anybody that you're leaving here, because then they won't come here, they won't follow you to Rosedale. Uh -huh. So then the, the girls that I used to sell to, 
And I got mad. I said, why didn't you tell us you were leaving? I said, well, the boss told me not to say anything. Oh. But anyway, I was more honest with them. I'd find something, if they didn't fit them, just look just right on a different size that looked better, or whatever went better with it, I'd tell them, you know. So they liked me. So I was, uh, then uh, when I quit, finally, or he sold the business, then he wrote me a note and said, you're a super, you were a super lady. Oh, well, that was <laughs> great. What, what business was that? Uh, W.J. Martini. Oh. It was a clothing, a ladies' clothing store. Oh. And you uh, said you've been in this house for a while. How, how long have you been on your, in this, the house we're in today? In this house here? Yeah. Since 1954. 50, oh. 58 years. So you, your kids all grew up here? Yeah. Well. Yeah. So they all mm -hmm. went to the schools here. Mm -hmm. And these are supposed to be the best schools in the country, mm -hmm. right here, better in California. <laughs> Have you been to these honor flights where they fly out to Washington, D.C. to see the World War II uh, memorial? Have you been on one of those? No, I've heard about them. Is that anything you'd be interested in? They they have uh, well, some of them. I know. I. My thought is that I, at the age I am, I'd like to just stay home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I can, sense. I can understand that. They pretty much take pretty good care of you, is what I've heard from well, the people that, do, yeah. that went on these. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, have you ever been back to any of the bases or Brindisi or anything? No. Yeah. Never went back across the ocean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen everything over there, I guess. Well, you were traveled all over the United States and all over the world during the Second World War, it sounds like. You were from yeah. California to the East Coast and oh, yeah. South and North. And yeah, I've done a lot of traveling. Uh, you know, they put me on a train and... <laughs> I know that train ride from uh, down south. That train must have gone a hundred mile an hour in those days. Huh. Steam, steam cylinder. Oh, yeah. Were the uh, troop trains like, or was it a passenger, regular passenger service? Oh, no, no. These were troop trains. They, uh, the cars were old, some old railroad cars they, they used for that. They must have dug them out of some. <coughs> Place and they use them <laughs> to transport the troops. Like a World War One troop train, with yeah, bare, yes, little I, bunks and things. Yeah, I, oh. think, I think so. Yeah, and uh, what was San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center like back then? Is it a big? Was it a big place when you when you got there initially? Or? Well, <clears throat> it was big. Yeah. They. Uh, they trained them there for a while, whatever they had to train them in, and then they, then they shipped them out to wherever they're going next, you know, to pilot training or or a navigation or bomb, bomb to learn how to run the bomb site. It's the place you went through. I think they that's Lackland Air Force Base, if I if I'm correct, and it's still in use as the basic training facility for the Air Force. So all those years ago, you saw it pretty early in the in the process, but it's still being used uh, yeah. to train Air Force uh, personnel even today. That's, that's where they have Officer Candidate School, too, I think. My brother went down there. Yeah, yeah. Did they ever put you in one of those pressure chambers and then they had you... Yeah, <coughs> decompression cha chamber, yeah. yeah. They put you in there and they pump the, pump the air out of there. And you sit there writing, um, writing, you know, writing your name or whatever, and you think you're doing real good. They, they get you out of there, and you, you're back normal again. You, oh my God, <laughs> is that what I did? <laughs> <clears throat> well, my uh, my dad had kept his entire life the little certificate thing that was about the size of a business card that said he had gone through, successfully gone through that. So it must have been a, a serious experience to go through that decompression yeah. uh, chamber because he kept the record that showed he successfully did that down there at San Antonio. It's dated with a stamp and everything. Um, did you keep any orders or any of those kind of written things that they would give you as to, you know, you're supposed to go here on this date and so forth? 
Or you don't well, keep Well, I have my those. 201 file. Every officer had a 201 file with everything in there. Yeah. Did you keep a, like a bombardier's uh, log or anything like that? Where of uh, the missions that you were on? Or? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I don't think they wanted you to do too much of that stuff because yeah. it was so s secret, you know. You could get shot down and they didn't want to have all that information mm -hmm. in the Germans' hands. In fact, they, uh, after the war, they still told you, don't, don't uh, talk too much about what the secret stuff you did in the war mm -hmm. until about 1975. Then they said, well, you, can do, you say whatever you want to about that. Oh. Now, otherwise it was strictly secret. So all your missions, all 56, were secret missions? Yeah, all secret. Did you uh, run into flak at all? or? Yeah, yeah, we got flak. They shoot at us, but uh, we go into evasive action, you know, uh -huh. gliding down, doing this way, back and forth like that. You could still get hit, I suppose. But, and they'd have... Uh, they shoot at her with a uh, <coughs> rifle, machine gun, they have the tracer bullets. Uh -huh. You could see the tracer bullet coming up at you, but you couldn't see the bullets in between the tracer bullets. Right. <coughs> yeah. Well, we were pretty lucky. Well, we planned our missions very carefully, the navigator and I, in the afternoon. We planned for we were not going to be near any known gunnery, uh -huh. gunnery emplacements. Was the B-24 a noisy airplane to ride in, or what no. was your impression of the no, airplane? No. The Pratt & Whitney engines, they purred like a kitten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you must have good ground crews support then, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah we still hear from that guy in California that worked on our plane, the B-24, to keep it in good condition. Oh, really? So the, the crew, one of the crew members is kept in touch after the war with you? Well, he was on the ground crew that kept yeah. the plane. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you told me this, was there a name on the plane? Was it painted or anything with no. nose art? Or? No. The plane were all painted black. Oh, yeah. Okay. They didn't have anything else on them, just black. Black planes? Yeah. The black B-24. And then uh, the carpet beggar name, was that, did that have significance or what, where did they well, come from? Well, you know what I think of that? General Doolittle. I think he was a pretty smart pilot and all that. But I think he, I thought he was pretty dumb to give us that name, carpet beggar. You know, carpet beggar, after the Civil War in this country, right. What were was something bad? Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> I I wonder. I hated that name, carpetbaggers that he gave us, General Doolittle. They're more like carpet bombers as opposed to carpet baggers. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so he's the one who gave you the the name for the, the yeah. bomb group. Yeah. yeah. And that was just for the 801st, or was that? For the 801st, 492nd. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Ed and Betty, for talking to us uh, today and telling your, your stories. Uh, what I want to do is I'll turn this into some DVDs for you and your, your kids so that oh, yeah. we've got it uh, recorded. And, uh, well, that'll be good. Yeah. yeah, and I appreciate the chance to hear your, your stories. It sounds like you're lucky to be here uh, after having gone yeah. through all those experiences. Yeah. Was there anything else? Uh, you never got one furlough, did you, Ed? Not one furlough. Not during the war, no. Before the war, after I graduated from Midland, uh, where I learned to, uh, to run the bomb site, and they sent me home and <clears throat> went to one of the neighbors that I'd worked for when he was. He used to run a threshing machine in, in the fall, and he gave me a job. And then it, my whole family, my mother and dad and I, went 
went to his place and had a nice dinner during my furlough. So that was nice. And you also had two brothers in the service. Yeah. Oh, what did your brothers do? My, my one was too old to go overseas, but he was uh, down in Evanston, Illinois, helping to, uh, to work with the German prisoners that w were there. Oh. The German prisoners were used to do work over there. Yeah. Uh -huh. And they were good people who did good work. Mm -hmm. And my younger brother, he was in uh, some place, he, he was actually uh, doing a lot of traveling in Germany. He said, he told me it seemed like he uh, rode a truck, you know, to go somewhere and then at night they, they bring him back again. For, for, I don't know what, what the deal was, but he was in some, he was not in the infantry was in probably uh, artillery or something like that. Mm -hmm. What's your older brother's name? <coughs> my oldest? Yeah. My oldest brother was Rudolf Erickson. Mm -hmm. And what's your younger brother's? And my next one who went overseas, now didn't go overseas, Clarence. Mm -hmm. Clarence Erickson. Then I had another brother that worked for the railroad. He didn't he was important enough on his job that he didn't have to go in service mm -hmm. because he worked for the railroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, his name was Orville. Oh. And my young brother was John. Oh. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Thank you. I'd like to get a picture, uh, if I could, of two of the two of you and Larry. And this might show up. Uh, you might see yourself in the newsletter or something. I don't know. We'll see. We're going to uh, turn the camera off here at this time.